This is Spiritual Rants, and it's a podcast, and you knew that, right? Or you wouldn't be here. It's a podcast about, uh, I'm guiding you through the one-year Bible. What's the one-year Bible? You can buy one. I don't know why I'm giving them a commercial, but I am. You can get them in Barnes & Noble. There's a there's another commercial for Barnes & Noble anyway. How about uh, Lifeway? How about ScriptureTruth.com? Or uh, CBD.com? Anyway, you can find a one-year Bible uh, just about anywhere. And you can find it in your favorite translation. So if you like a new international version... You can get that. If you like the New American Standard Bible, you can get that. That's one I use in my blogs. Uh, You can get a Living Bible. I like that one a lot. And you can get uh, a BLT. No, it's not a BLT. It's an NLT, a New Living Translation. But I prefer the Living Bible, but those are a little harder to find, and the NLT's similar. Anyway, get a one-year Bible, or you can get the readings online. Or go to my, that's, here's the best thing. Go to my blog. My blog is at jerryrothhauser.com. But who can spell that? Well, my family does. But other than that, uh, you can find it at Spiritual Rants. Dot com spiritual rants dot com it gets you to the same place and it'll give you the readings and this week the readings are Exodus eight verse one through twenty one verse twenty two right actually verse twenty one so eight one through twenty one twenty one and then uh, later on I'll tell you we're going to be in Matthew. And then you can also read Psalms and Proverbs, but we don't have forever. So I'm probably not going to mention too much about Psalms and Proverbs today. In fact, okay, I'm not going to mention anything about Psalms and Proverbs this week. But read it anyway. It's good stuff. All right, so now we're in the book of Exodus already. If you've already been reading the scriptures and following along with the readings, you're already into chapter 8 in Exodus, which means we're going to find out what plagues you. In in fact, we're going to find out even more what plagued the Pharaoh. But maybe we'll take it metaphorically just for fun on what plagues us, but we're also going to talk about the literal scripture, the literal scripture. So what we're going to find out is that Abraham had a couple of kids, and they had a couple of kids, and then they had a bunch of kids. (laughs) Well, Jacob in particular. And those we know today is the Jews. One of the last ones, the 11th son, was named Joseph. And his brothers deposited him, basically, randomly, in Egypt. And all of his descendants grew up into the Jewish nation. They incubated in Egypt. So those were Joseph and his brothers and their family and their kids. So what happened, there were 70 of Jacob's family, and they grew into like 2 million over like 400 years. And they were scaring Pharaoh and his people. So they enslaved them, of course. What else would you do with people that are helping you out and saved you from famine and annihilation as you enslaved them? But that's what happened. So God had to rescue his people, and he did it through this guy named Moses. Moses was supposed to be offed as a baby 
but miraculously was saved and was raised by his mother. And I know what you're thinking. That's dumb. Why did you mention that? He was raised by his mother. Because he was taken away from his mother to be for safekeeping and was rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter and miraculously was given back to his mother and she was paid for taking care of her son, Moses, but was in the Pharaoh's household and grew up with all the amenities and education that would go to Pharaoh's son. Pretty good deal, right? I bet your mother wished she was getting paid for taking care of you. I'll bet she was. Anyway, here's the theme of the Bible. I've been saying this and saying this and saying this, and hopefully you, you got it. I think the theme of the Bible is that rebellion leads to death. We saw that with Adam and Eve right from the beginning, and you see it throughout the Bible. And then a relationship with God leads to life. So what's the catch? The catch is that the relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And when you trust him, you're going to have a relationship with God. Well, Pharaoh would have none of that. God worked on Moses for 40 years. He was in Pharaoh's household. He tried to take things into his own hands, literally by strangling one of the Egyptians that he didn't think was acting toward toward the Jews. So he tried to kill him, tried to off him. And then he had to flee after that and grew up 40 more years, if you call that growing up, because usually 40, you're grown up. But after that, he became a shepherd. That seems to be the chosen profession of God's people, don't you think? Either pastors or like with lammies. So, Moses was out there, he got married, and then 40 years later, he confronted Pharaoh. That's where we're at. He saw God at the burning bush in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, and had a personal relationship and communication with God. Pretty cool deal, right? And he was God's chosen person and shepherd to shepherd the entire nation at that point of two million people, all the Jews. Now, let me point this out about Pharaoh, because Moses was bringing the message of a relationship with God, and Pharaoh rejected it. And we're going to see that all through the Bible, people rejecting a relationship with With God, although he gives it graciously and through Christ and through the sacrifice of Christ, they reject it. And then eventually, when we get to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation in December, here's a verse we find, two of them. Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues... See, we're going to talk about plagues in Exodus. But then there are plagues in kind of what I call hell on earth, although it's not as bad as actual hell. It is like hell on earth. And there are people that are being killed by plagues, God's judgment on the earth. And they did not repent, it says, which is a change of mind. They didn't change their mind. They kept rebellious toward God. And as I just mentioned, that ends in death. So they did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk in verse 21. They did not 
repent of their murders, nor their sor sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. They just wouldn't change their mind. They were stubborn. We're going to find out in the course of our studies that Christians change their mind all the time. Not about God, but about their actions. And they change from one glory to another degree of glory. From one degree of glory to another degree of glory as they change. That's the way God looks at it. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Anyway, these people in Revelation basically shake their fists at God. They're mad because God is trying to get their attention. He refu They refuse to give their attention to God. And they just get mad at him. Now, you just got the story of Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians. Yes, I put a, a hyphen, or not a hyphen, an apostrophe. I put an apostrophe there, and I call them the Egyptians. Anyway, the book of Exodus, just by the name, book of Exodus, you can pretty much figure out that it has to do with these plagues, if you've already heard the story, and about their exiting Egypt, going back to Canaan, the promised land. That's where God wanted them to be. That's what God wanted to affect. And you probably already heard about the Red Sea, you've heard about the plagues, so we're going to cover that briefly, and I want to point out a few things to you, because, you know, one of the most important things you can do when you're reading Scripture is observe what you're reading. Well, yeah, of course I ought to do that. Well, yeah, you should, but you probably don't, as dumb as I may sound when I say that to you. You can just glitch through it. Now, there are some things you can just kind of glean through, and I'll let you know. Um, but you need to hit the high points. And here's something you may not have known about Exodus. Of course, it's called Exodus because they're absconding. You know, if it was my choice and I was going to name Exodus, I would call it abscondence. That's not even a word, but I would call it that, because they're absconding. And if you read my blogs, you'll find that word a lot, because for some reason, I think it's funny. So you can notice that when you go to spiritualrants.com. Did I mention spiritualrants.com to look at my blog? Anyway, the original Hebrew name of the book of Exodus is not Exodus. It was names. Isn't that kind of interesting? Names. Now, you can find a lot of names of God that will give you an insight about God and who he is and the way he cares about you, the way he loves you. But you will find several of them in the book of Exodus. So let me just point those out to you. Just a few of them. And these would have been good names for Pharaoh to know. It would have been good if he already had the book of Exodus that was written out for him, that Moses could have written it and he would have known what had happened, but that couldn't have happened because Moses was living it as he was encountering Pharaoh and as he was learning about God. But let me just give you a few of those names in the book of Exodus of God. The most important one is Yahweh. And that's not Burger King at all. Um, okay, you figure out that joke. Because it's, it's no joking matter. Because what it means is God is the great I Am. When Moses encountered God at the burning bush, 
He said, who are you? Because Hebrews wanted to know who, you, who, who they were dealing with. And so God gave him a name, his own name, only it's not a noun. He doesn't care about grammar. He gave him a verb. The verb is the great I am. I am who I am, which means he is in the present, but he was in the past and he'll be in the future, but he's emphasizing that he's in the present. In Exodus 6, 6 and 7, I'll read it to you. Therefore, say to the Israelites, God is speaking, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a, posi- as a possession. I am the Lord. So when he uses that name, Yahweh, all throughout the Old Testament, he's speaking of his presence. And at the burning bush, it was a form of that verb. I am who I am. That would have been good for Pharaoh to know. Here's another one. And we talked about this one in like the second podcast, which was the first week of one-year Bible readings, Elohim. It's plural, which insinuates uh, and connotes the Trinity, because it's plural. And so there's a connotation of plurality, which we would say, theologically speaking, that God is one. There is one God. And that was one of the mottos of the Hebrews. But what they didn't understand, that we know from the New Testament, but it's in the Old Testament, and I explained that in that podcast, that there's a plurality of personality, but there's one God. And when the midwives who feared God in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, that word for God, when it said they feared God, is Elohim. They were fearing the tripartite God. And they did not do what the king of of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live the midwives, because they were afraid of God. That's, that's good thinking. And if the government ever tells you to do something that God tells you to do, well, what's your priority? You do what God wants you to do. It's called civil disobedience, right? That's the technical, political word for that. Now, here's a good one in the book of Exodus. The Lord is my banner, Yahweh Nisi in the Hebrew. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. In the book of Song Song of Solomon, we're going to find out that God's banner over us is love. We're going to find that out. But that's down the road. But in Exodus seventeen fifteen, the Lord is my banner. Is that your banner? Are you proud of God? Romans one sixteen, God or Paul said he is not ashamed of the gospel, which means he's not ashamed of God and His grace and Jesus. That's what that means in essence. Exodus fifteen, you'll find this. Between verses 22 and 26, the Lord heals Yahweh Rophe. Yahweh Roph. You could put it that way, I guess. This This is great because when the Hebrews went out from, uh, from Egypt and they wandered around the wilderness, you maybe already heard about that. 
Here's what God said to them. If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer, the Lord who heals. When you're looking for healing, it's okay to go to the doctor, but I hate to tell you, God outranks him. In fact, I don't hate to tell you, you already know that. Someone needs to tell the doctors. <laughs> Medical humor. All right. So that gives you another name of God in Exodus, the original name of the book of Exodus in Hebrew is names. And so I'm giving you several of these wonderful names of God. You ever heard the Amy Grant song, El Shaddai? Oh, I love that song. It comes from Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. God says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. El is God. Shaddai, Almighty. By, by, not, by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. And probably it'll be eternity before we fully understand God. Okay, because he's infinite, and so we're never going to get there to fully know him, but we'll be knowing him a lot better and see him face to face after we've trusted Christ and gone on to our, our eternal reward. Well, a.k.a. heaven. All right, I already told you about El Olam, didn't I? Exodus 3.15. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Notice the family involved there. God cares about families. He cares about human beings, even Pharaoh. And his name, it says in that verse, my name is forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And then El Roy God who sees. That's in Exodus 23, verse 17. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. And that word there for sovereign is Lord or master. He's the Lord and he's the master of all. That's repeated in Exodus in chapter 34 and 23. Pharaoh, though, he doesn't care about knowing God. He thought probably he was God, and he's going to find out that he's not God. You know, Chevy Chase, back in my day, right after television was invented, he used to be on TV, and he would say, I'm Chevy Chase, and you're not. Well, we could use that for God. He's God, and you're not. And when you learn that, when we get to the Ten Commandments, that's in, in essence what the Ten Commandments are about. God is God, and we're not. Pharaoh didn't figure that out. And so what God did was turned up the heat and uh, turned up a bunch of stuff on Pharaoh for him to learn that he wasn't God and that he should submit to God. And you may be thinking, well, um, I don't think any leaders of nations submit to God. Well, some of them do. And we'll get to one who had his mind changed. That's what repent means. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. What a name. Why don't people... You know, name that anymore. I don't know. I think it's uh, that song, Nebuchadnezzar and I Don't Care. Never... All right, sorry about the singing. But all of these plagues, probably in metaphorical form, 
we've experienced, so I'll point that out to you. Here's what Warren Wiersbe says, and I'm going to probably repeat this more than once because I think it's a great quote. Warren Wiersbe said, when his family or when his people, God's people, are in the furnace, the creator keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. He knows how long and how much, and he is always in control. So whatever you're going through, God knows what you're going through, and he knows how bad it is, and he won't allow it to be any worse than he wants it to be. I was behind a car yesterday. And I said to my wife, okay, we have to note what that bumper sticker says. And what it said was, it said, be grateful. Bumper sticker. And it said, be grateful no matter what. That's pretty good. Be grateful no matter what. The only way I think you can be that way is to have a viewpoint, and have your life's aspect being focused on God. Now, in New Testament form, we would say Ephesians 5.25, for everything, give thanks for God. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, give thanks in all things. If you can give thanks to everything, in everything, you will be, I think, God-centered. Be grateful for everything. Count your blessings. That's what my wife says to me all the time. She says, count your blessings, because I'm a griper. And she says, count your blessings, one by one. Someone should write a hymn about that. Okay, they already did. All right, so we get to these plagues. The plagues with Pharaoh were God's trying to get his attention. Uh, of course, you know, the way the secular word, world uh, frames things, um, and particularly this one network that is run by the federal government. I don't know how that happens, but okay, the federal government has their own network. And they had a special on Noah's Ark. And they said it was all about God punishing human beings. Well, he had to, because no one wanted to have anything to do with him. So it's like, okay, we go back to the drawing board, and he did with Noah and his three sons. We talked about that already. And, you know, when you encounter things on TV, normally it's going to be, from a secular point of view, a lot of it is, and, you know, then you encounter things like that, that God is trying to punish people. There was another program I saw the other night, and they were talking about um, Babel or something like that, and they were babbling and how God wants to wipe people out, punish people, and, and we're going to get to slavery, and they completely misconstrue what the scripture says about slavery. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. God was really trying to show his love to Pharaoh by getting his attention. And sometimes you have to get people's attention with a two by four. You know, last week we talked about church discipline, where sometimes if someone's involved in a bad sin and they're continuing to go to church, you have to toss them out. Not because you dislike them or you hate them or you're trying to punish them. You're just trying to get their attention and, and get them to come back to God. And when they do, then you let them back into the church. That happened uh, back in church times. They had to toss someone in the book of Corinthians, and, and they were committing a gross sin. And out of love, they had to toss them in 1 Corinthians around chapter 5, and then in 2 Corinthians, they brought them back again. 
So if Pharaoh had changed his mind and had repented, God had gotten his attention, well, you know, things would have been completely different for Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but no, he wouldn't have any of it. So Moses was sent to Pharaoh, and God said, uh, take your cane, and when you're before Pharaoh, I'll have it change into a serpent. <laughs> so Pharaoh said, no big deal, my guys can do that. And they changed uh, canes into serpents. And so what did Moses do? He had his serpent eat all of the other serpents. Now that would get my attention. When I was getting saved at Butler University years ago, uh, God, God got my attention. The fellow that was trying to explain to me the grace of God handed me a New Testament. He kept saying over and over and over again, read John 9. Eventually, I took his, his New Testament. And I said, I don't even know where it is, and I turned right to it. That got my attention. That's all it took for me. And for Pharaoh, that didn't help. Uh, you know, in Jerry Maguire, the the main line throughout that movie is, well, at least at the end, Jerry Maguire says to his girlfriend, or did she say it to him? You had me at hello. You had me at hello. That was hello, Pharaoh. God calling. Can you hear me now? And he ignored it. So the next plague was frogs. By the way, page 120 of the Bible Knowledge Commentary and you can buy that probably through Barnes & Noble, through Amazon, through... Here, I'm giving commercials again. Did I say spiritualrants.com? Okay. Um, CBD.com. Um, Scripture Truth is a good one. They give you the best prices probably if you can find something there. Uh, at any rate, all of these plagues are insults to the Egyptian gods. And there's different names for the Egyptian gods, and I can't pronounce them, so I'm not going to try. There's one I can pronounce. We'll get there. So frogs started jumping all around the place, and um, I think the reaction was jumping Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Now, that see, if I hadn't muffed, muffed that, that would have been a funny joke. Jump in Jehoshaphat. But they couldn't say that because that was a Jewish king in the future. We'll get to him. So they, they couldn't have said that. And then, let's see, the second plague was frogs. The third plague was lice. That inspired Brian Wilson. He wrote a, a, a song called Wouldn't It Be Lice. No, he didn't. It was Wouldn't It Be Nice. Lice are not nice. They're horrible. That didn't get Pharaoh's attention. Moses kept saying, let my people go. And he kept saying, okay. And then he said, ah, uh, JK. He's just kidding. Fourth plague, flies all over the place. Flies. They put dust up in the air, Moses and his older brother, Aaron. He put dust up in the air and they changed into flies. Now, only the first three or so plagues affected the Jews, and after that, they didn't. So, um, the flies didn't affect the Jews, and that's where you got that phrase, no flies on you. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. All right, fifth plague is moraine. Moraine. Moraine is... A uh, sickness on cattle and animals. So the Marine that were out on the train uh, got sick. The sixth plague was boils. That had Pharaoh boiling mad. If you've ever had a boil, they are so irritating and you don't want to have one. But they all had boils. The Egyptians did. The seventh plague was hail. And 
sorry about this one. It, it was like hell on earth. Just like I said in the book of Revelation. That was an insult to the God nut. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. That's the only name that I, I think I can pronounce. Nut. Well, there was uh, Osiris or something like that later on. But uh, that was an insult to Nut. You know, uh, when I was in Boy Scouts years ago, I had a troop master. We went to Valley Forge for the Jamboree. And my, uh, well, I hope they, I hope he's not listening and offended, but his name was Norman Nutt. His name was Norman Nutt the Third, And when we were at the Jamboree, he had a son. A baby. And guess what they named that, that son? Norman Nutt the Fourth. That's not the worst. <laughs> the worst was my mom was picking me up from uh, wrestling practice when I was in high school. And a friend of mine said, can I hitch a, 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 a ride with you and your mom? I said, yeah, I'm sure. And so he got in the car, and my mom said, and you have to know my mom, she was very boisterous and outgoing and and loving. But she, but she said, uh, what's your friend's name? Aren't you going to introduce your, your friend to me? And I said, yeah, it's Joe. Oh, okay, Joe. Joe what? I, I, give me his name. What's his name? And you have to know my mom. You know, she can't just leave it alone. Here's what my friend's name was, Joe Weirdo. That was his name. That's how it was spelled. I hope he's not listening because he was a fantastic guy, but that was his name. His name was Joe Weirdo. So I had to say to my mom, I said, well, his name is Joe Weirdo. And she said, don't be a smart guy. Now, what's his name? Okay, well, you can imagine how things progressed <laughs> there. So, anyway, not only that, but then the next plague was locusts, and that was an offense to that same god, Nut. And so whoever that god goddess was was offended because... God sent a plague of locusts. So when we talk about all of these and think of them in a metaphorical way, like, you know, gnat, gnats, you know, as a pastor and just ministering online, I have people giving me a hard time all the time, all the time. And you're, you're going to see that in the life of Moses, everyone plaguing him. And giving them a hard time. The Jews all the time. Giving them a hard time. And you can see how far he got with uh, Pharaoh. But here is a great verse. If you're being plagued by all kinds of things. You know, maybe the gnats, uh, maybe flies, um, hail hits your car. Or metaphorically, all of these things. Locusts for instance. We'll get to minor prophets, but here's a great verse for you today. Joel 2, verse 25, God says, I will restore to you the years which the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, that's another insect, the destroyer and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. God had told me years ago, that there would be a period of darkness in my life. And sure enough, I had six bypasses, and then I've had chronic fatigue ever since then. And that, if you're a minister of God and you have to bear things like that, J. Vernon McGee had cancer, and he said that he got much closer to the Lord after he had made it through his bout of cancer. And God will restore to you what hardships in your life have taken place. So whoever you are, there's a promise for you. Joel 2, verse 25. Well, then there's darkness. 
uh, the ninth plague. And this darkness was like darker than any kind of darkness you've probably ever experienced. In fact, the saints of God, and the saints are not just saints that are endorsed by any church. A saint is the word for anyone who's trusted Christ. And God will put his saints through darkness, metaphorically. And this darkness was darker than any darkness that had ever been experienced probably in the history of the earth. And, you know, you couldn't see your hand in front of your eyes, which you wouldn't get much, you know, enjoyment out of that anyway. I stole that joke from Groucho. And then finally, God proves to the Egyptians that you can't kill my boys. The firstborn of a G- of Egypt were threatened with death, but the Israelites were protected if they had put blood of lambs on their doorposts the jams of their doors, as it were. And what did that represent? Christ. I said Christ is all throughout the Bible, even the Old Testament. And that was the festival. They commemorated it with the festival of Passover. And then they looted the Egyptians. They said, give me a bunch of good stuff. And they said, yeah, we'll be glad to do that and get out of here. And they had plenty as they were traveling through the wilderness. So anyway, you have Passover. That's important to Jews even to today. And then uh, you have um, another one, another festival you're going to read about. That takes place at about the same time as Passover the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They had to get out. They had to, abscon- uh, they had to abscond really quick. So they don't have time for the bread to rise. That's why they eat that kind of bread. And it's a commemoration at the time of Passover. Because the leaven represents sin. You know, there's a <laughs> there was one a uh, new church start around here and it was like uh the 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 church of leavening and so in one place in scripture leavening is good but usually it's not good it's usually a symbol of sin and so they didn't have um sin in their bread anyway you can read about that and then they start their murmuring Not that God hadn't done enough miracles for them, but they made it through the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea, the Red Sea. There's a story about a little boy, and he comes home from Sunday school, and his parents say, what'd you learn in uh, Sunday school? And it was a liberal church, I guess he was going to. And so liberals don't believe in the Red Sea. They think it was the Reed Sea that you could just walk through it, which isn't true. That's not true. And he said, uh, well, uh, here's what I learned in Sunday school. He said, I learned that God drowned the Egyptians through like a couple of inches of water. See, he didn't get the point. But he did get the point. He got the good the good point about God. All right, so you're going to read about all of those plagues. You're going to read about the Red Sea. Then God gave them special food. And they murmured about that and complained. Poor Moses had to listen to all of that. They got manna. And that was the name of this, like, bread kind of substance that God gave them. It appeared... Every morning, which is a metaphor for us, that God takes care of us. Uh, When you already read it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, actually 6, 
toward the end, you, you, you can read verse 633 that God provides for us all the time, and he did for them. Except that on Sundays, well, it was Saturday for them, they were supposed to pick up double on Fridays, and then you'd have plenty the next day. Now, if you tried to pull that kind of a stunt on like a Monday and get more than what you need, uh, then it would rot. So that was a pretty cool miracle anyway. And then they got upset because, oh, we miss meat. We need some meat. Can we have meat? (laughs) They whined. So God said, okay, yeah, we'll give you quail. And not Dan quail. It was meat. It would just appear. Uh, The wind would blow and there would be all these quails they could just pick up and have that meat. And guess what happened? You ever heard of that phrase, be careful what you wish for? Well, that happened to them. They weren't satisfied with what God gave them. And it basically says the quail came out their nostrils because they ate so much of it, they made pigs out of themselves, and God allowed them to do it. Okay, read that. The Sabbath was given to Israel. It was a Saturday. We worship on Sunday now, because that's the day that Christ was resurrected. But they worshiped on a Saturday. That's in the uh, Ten Commandments, that they're supposed to keep that day holy. They needed some water. That was a legit request. So Moses said, uh, hit the rock, hit a rock one time, and then water will come out of it. That's a pretty cool trick, don't you think? So he did. Now later on, he messed that up, and he hit a rock twice. He wasn't supposed to hit the rock twice. He was just supposed to talk to it. In this this instance, they, he was supposed to hit the rock. And that was a symbol again of Christ. Christ is the rock. Often when you read about a rock in scripture, it's about Jesus. This rock is about Jesus. And he was smitten. He was hit. And he was hit when he was crucified. That was a picture of Christ. Then Moses relied on his father-in-law. You see how important uh, family was to him. His father-in-law, his, his name was Jethro. Not like the Beverly Hillbillies. Well, yeah, exactly like the Beverly Hillbillies, but he wasn't like that Jethro. I, I can guarantee because Moses was going to him for advice. He had another name. His other name was R-E-U-E-L. Rule, because he ruled in his family, but he was also giving hints to Moses about how he should rule, because Moses was ruling over the Jews at that time, and he was telling Moses to sp- spread the work out and get some get some help, which is good advice in business even today. That was in chapter eight of Exodus. In chapter 19, Israel was supposed to prepare for a visit from God, and God puts on a cosmic show for them. Lightning, thunders, noise, and Moses went up on Mount Sinai and got the Ten Commandments. Mel Brooks makes a joke about it, and uh, Mel Brooks plays Moses coming down the hill, And he says, here I've got for you these 20 commandments. And then he drops one of the tablets. And he says, I mean these 10 commandments. No, God knew it was going to be 10 commandments. And then you can hear what happened there. Read about. Don't don't get it from Mel Brooks. Read it in Exodus 20. And you're going to find out that Moses got really angry because he came down the hill. And they were worshiping a calf. Talk about uh, dunderheads. (laughs) And then Moses got mad. He broke the tablets. There were two tablets, five each. 
Anyway, you can read about that. But then we get to slavery, and we're getting really short on time. But let me tell you this about slavery. And you'll hear liberals and non-believers talk about slavery in the Old Testament. Yeah, there was slavery, but it was like indentured servanthood. More like what we had in Revolutionary War times up in the North when, you know, you would have mentors and learn your craft. That's more what it was like. In fact, it was such a, a good deal that... There was a law later uh, in in the Old Testament that if you wanted to stay with the family where you were the, were, uh, the servant or the slave, you could stay there if you wanted to, but you'd have to have a hole drilled into your ear. Yikes. It must have really been good. Yeah, I'd love it here. Why don't you put a hole in my ear? Well, that's what they did with an awl. A W L. But what I say is that was a metaphor of how they could take all of you. All right. Well, if you listen to this podcast for very long, those jokes don't get really much better. All right. Did I tell you that the theme of the Bible is rebellion leads to death and relationship leads to life? Well, Jesus said to little children, don't forbid them coming to me because he was a rabbi and normally you wouldn't want to bother a teacher at that level with a bunch of kids. And he said, no, you know, let them come to me. And he said, and look, Matthew 19, like verse 13 and following, because that's going to be your reading for the week, is 1913 through chapter 23 through 39. And what he was saying was, you have to be like these children if you want to trust me. You know what's amazing is the seminaries and the churches. Churches can ruin people. They turn them into legalists. They teach them religion. They told them tell them things that they have to do rather than just teaching the scripture, and seminaries turn out these pastors that do that, teach people religion and legalisms and things that you have to do, you know, uh, don't smoke and don't chew, uh, etc., which, you know, they're probably things that aren't good for you, but, but if you know the Lord and love him, then you're going to put away the sins along the line, you know, it's gradual takes time. One of our mottos in our little church, and you can come to our place, we give free breakfast. In fact, we give free teaching. Um, So if you're interested in that, let me know and send me an email or whatever. I'll tell you how to get here and we'd be glad to have you. We're covering end times right now. But here's one of our Mottos, no religion, no God. Okay, but we have have to get the spelling right. N-O, religion, K-N-O-W, God. Cute, huh? All right, so then Jesus in Matthew talks about the, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, in the vineyard. And you ought to read about that because that's like not fair. Well, what it represents is grace. That people who get in at the end of their life, which isn't very smart, but if they do, and they trust Christ later in life, right before they die, and you don't know when you're going to die. That's the problem. But if you get in that late, you get in, and you still get to heaven. Same as someone who was saved and trusted Christ when he was seven years old. Then you'll hear about James and John who request at a high level for themselves in in heaven. Their mother makes their request for them. And you can read about Jesus' answer about that and about favorites. 
But, you know, the idea of this and uh, I think favorites with Jesus reminds me when I was teaching college and I was um, accused of having favorites in my students. I thought, that's puzzling. Why would anyone think that? Well, here's why. Because here's who the favorites were of my college students. The ones who wanted to be favorites. The ones who wanted to know about church history or history or whatever I was teaching, theology and Bible. If they wanted to know about those things, they would appear to be favorites only because they got close to me and asked questions and hung around with me. But anyone could have done that. I really didn't have any favorites. And that's the way it was with the apostles who originally were the disciples. And John is one of the best examples of that because he would huddle in close to Christ, close to Christ, when they ate. And he'd always lay down right next to Jesus and kind of huddled with him. Because he loved him. So he would have appeared to be a favorite. And he was a favorite, but only because he wanted to be. So Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men in chapter 20 of Matthew. And don't forget, whenever Jesus does a miracle, it's to teach. It's not just for the physical benefit of the person that he's healing. It's to teach somebody something. Those two blind men who had their eyes opened, had their eyes opened of faith. And it's a metaphor. So don't don't forget that. Always keep it in mind, like the cleansing of the temple. Jesus was draining the swamp. And... You can read about that. The chief priests and the elders used to be really irritated by him. And so what did Jesus do? Again, to teach them, they, he would irritate them even more. He told them the parable of two sons and how at the end, the householder who had servants, uh, the servants slew his son. You need to read about that. Really what it's about Israel. What he's saying to the chief priests and elders is, you don't accept me. And ultimately you're going to off me. And they did. So that was chapter 21. And in chapter 22, there's a parable of a marriage feast for the king's son. And again, it's about, and, and it dawns on them. I think it dawns on them. It's like, uh uh-oh, this isn't just a nice story. He's talking about us. And that was the way Jesus communicated to them. Well, that about wraps things up. Don't forget that there's Psalms to be read and Proverbs. Proverbs 5 is about prostitutes. (laughs) If, If you're offended by that, don't read it. But, I mean, it's um, it's in a form that I, I think it won't offend you. Uh, and it's it's good for young men to know about. And that's what Proverbs is about. It's, it's wisdom of Solomon for young men. Well, that wraps about, that wraps everything up for this week. And I hope you'll be back next week. Spiritualrants.com. And then we're on Libsyn, if you want to find the podcast, which you found it somehow. And it's also on YouTube, it's on iTunes, it's on Google Play. And just do a search for Spiritual Rants. This is Jerry Rothhauser, I'm your host. Tell your friends about this. Spread the word. Start spelling it. Oh, don't, t- don't let them listen to the end when I sing. Start spreading the word. All right, see you next week. Bye. <laughs>